Can someone say something? I want to test some. Yeah, um, I can hear you. Yes. Hi, Bonnie. Okay, I hear you. Yeah. Good. Okay, we can start now. I will. All right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, let me say thank you to the India International Center for organizing this discussion on uh, a new collection of essays titled In Search of Peace for Afghanistan. Uh, the editor of the collection, Javed Shiras, is with us today, uh, as are several distinguished uh, contributors to the volume. Um, Afrasiab Khatak, former senator from uh, Pakistan and former head of the uh, Independent Human Rights Tribunal of Pakistan, Barnett Rubin, a uh, senior non-resident fellow at the Center for International Cooperation and former advisor both to the SRAP uh, and uh, to the uh, UN uh, Special Representative for Afghanistan. Barney, I think you are all familiar with his work and you know that he has both written extensively on Afghanistan and uh, is one of the leading experts uh, globally uh, on the peace process in that country. Uh, Javed Ludin uh, is the president of the Heart of Asia Society, which is one of the two organizations that have brought out this volume. Uh, the other organization is the Qatar Foundation. Uh, Javid is former Deputy Foreign Minister of Afghanistan um, and again is someone who has been deeply involved in the peace process. It looks like we have our moderator, Lakhtar Brahimi, with us. Uh, you are, of course, all of you very familiar. Yeah. I, I, uh, can hear you. I can hear you loud and clear now. Oh, on that's my, on my telephone. So, and... Uh, uh, it's perfect. I can follow the. Uh, uh, you can see me and hear me. Can you? Yeah. Yes, we can. Uh -huh. okay. uh, and uh, we are live now. Uh, the session is just started, and uh, let me continue. I have introduced the uh, speakers uh, and uh, uh, the title of the book, and I was just about to introduce you. Uh, Mr. Brahimi uh, is a very, very senior UN diplomat who has been involved with Afghanistan at two absolutely critical points. Uh, first, uh, uh, during the Najibullah and post-Najibullah period, and then uh, he chaired the Bonn Conference to establish an interim government in Afghanistan and was uh, the special representative of the UN Secretary General for Afghanistan from 2001 to 2004. Mr. Brahimi is the moderator uh, of this session and I will gratefully hand over to him. Thank you very, very much, uh, Radha. I do apologize to all of you. Uh, as I tried to tell you a minute ago, I am a total illiterate in matters of these new machines. I am of the last century and perhaps the century before. Uh, but I'm, 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 I'm honored to join you all in this discussion about an amazing uh, initiative that uh, was taken by Kaun Kakar in Kabul. Uh, and Kaun belongs to this uh, young Afghans, and by young I mean people who are under 50, uh, you know, uh, uh, they are all I think under 50, and they have started a number of, uh, you know, uh, uh, really wonderful initiatives. One of them is the Kakar Foundation, and the other is the Heart of Asia. Uh, you know what? What these uh, young people, this new generation of Afghans, are doing? Uh, they are showing that uh, uh, you know 
what progress Afghanistan has made since 2001. Uh, the Afghanistan, we, I think all of us knew before uh, 2001, uh, is not there anymore. And therefore, the people who are negotiating uh, in Doha and uh, may be going to other capital. Uh, some of them do belong to the period before 2000. And they, they should realize that their country is different now. The country has moved forward. And uh, their negotiations should be able to uh, create conditions for their country to move even more, uh, make even more progress not pull it back to where it was uh, 50, 60, 70, 100, or 1,000 years ago. Uh, so we wish them, we wish them uh, luck. And we are going to talk about this uh, initiative, Kaun uh, and his friends in Kabul, by uh, you know, inviting a number of people, Afghans and non-Afghans, to uh, provide contribution to this uh, great book that has been uh, published uh, uh, on the basis of these three letters that were exchanged between Najibullah and uh, Dr. <coughs> Kakar. Uh, we have, uh, you have just introduced everybody, so uh, there's no need to waste time and introduce again. Uh, it's a it's a it's a very good group to start a discussion. There will be others uh, organized by different uh, people interested in this project uh, to uh, make the, the book uh, known. I don't know how do you want us to uh, to, to start, but uh, I would like to start with you, Rada. We will go around and give everybody uh, an opportunity to say a few words for about five minutes, and then we will take it from there. Rada, will you will you uh, uh, say something? Uh, if you repeat what you said before, uh, it doesn't bother me because I can hear it. But perhaps you don't need to do that. Go ahead, Rada. You're on me. We we can hear. Yeah. Sorry, I muted my mic in, in to try to keep the audio good. Uh, well, thank you very much, Lakhtar. Um, this book has come out at, at, at a moment uh, when, once again, uh, some form of peace agreement is being discussed. Uh, and once again, uh, the problems and the obstacles uh, for that peace process are immense. Um, all over the region, the question of a U.S. withdrawal and uh, whether uh, there can be a peace agreement leading to some form of interim uh, government is at all possible. At the moment, as we see it, uh, efforts and discussions are ongoing, but we do not know what, if any, uh, uh, result will come in the next few weeks, uh, as it is the conference, the regional conference uh, with, Afghan, uh, with Afghanistan that was planned uh, for the end of April has had to be postponed. Um, there are uh, uh, people like Barney Rubin uh, who I think can give us an overview uh, both of the uh, thinking of uh, some of the key actors uh, internationally and also of uh, what is happening with the negotiations themselves. Uh, as you know, this volume actually compares uh, the 1990s period to the current situation to see what are the similarities, similarities and differences and what are the lessons perhaps that we can learn, all of us. I'm going to just talk a little bit about our region uh, and the issues that concern us. I mean, for India, interestingly, 
um, we are far less uh, engaged than we were perhaps in the 1990s or even in the early 2000s. Um, while our aid missions continue uh, both politically and in terms of security, it seems to me that our conversations uh, have reduced significantly. Uh, nevertheless, there is one uh, uh, new development that perhaps could help uh, for an Afghan peace process as well, which is the quiet, extremely hesitant uh, efforts between India and Pakistan to once more resume talks. Now that might perhaps uh, help at least to uh, uh, take one major problem, uh, if not out of the equation, at least sideline it a little bit in the equation. Uh, that is at least a hope that I have. Uh, we will hear more, I think, from Afrasiab about that. Uh, as far as I can see at this point in time, uh, while our uh, government is holding parallel discussions with different countries uh, that, that, that are seriously engaged with Afghanistan. Uh, we have not yet evolved a policy of our own. Uh, we still seem to be very much in the well, wait and watch mode. Uh, the only voices that we have heard recently uh, are that our government should establish some kind of working dialogue with the Taliban as well. And now I presume that various small track to or back channel efforts have uh, occurred from time to time in that direction. Um, but but uh, from my point of view, uh, while that is of course an important element for Indian analysts to consider, it seems to me that the far greater element is um, first, first of all, uh, how do we engage with all of Afghanistan's neighbors uh, to try and see if we can arrive at some kind of working formulas to help the peace process and uh, a stabilization process in Afghanistan. Uh, that is something where we, uh, uh, where we have some knowledge, some experience and some good relations. And uh, I would certainly have liked to have seen greater initiative in the regional direction uh, from the government of India. Um, the second thing that I think India needs to consider very carefully is that whichever way you cut it, uh, post a US withdrawal, there is going to be a considerable aid required by the uh, whichever Afghan government there is uh, for Afghanistan. And that is uh, mobilizing donors is another area where India can be active. Um, let me leave it at those two points over here and say only finally that the situation as far as India and regional politics is concerned is very different today from what it was during the Najibullah Kakkar period. There is a larger regional engagement with Afghanistan. Uh, while uh, terrorism and counterterrorism, and uh, to some extent uh, regional geopolitics will play an important part, uh, the Cold War element and the kinds of rivalries that we had to engage in during that period and after that period as well as the kind of alliances that we engaged in uh, uh, are no longer relevant uh, to the current period. In any case, uh, uh, we've seen realignments of various sorts, uh, which I would say actually broaden the space for engagement for India uh, in favor of some form of peace and stabilization process in Afghanistan. Uh, the fact that we do do not have to align uh, either uh, uh, against the US or against the or, or with or against the USSR 
uh, the fact that we now have to look uh, at uh, the Chinese uh, engagement in Afghanistan uh, uh, and think of how our relationships with, say, some of the Central Asian republics can help strengthen at least some form of security stabilization. Uh, uh, all of these are very, very different from the situation of the 1990s. Uh, and of course, we can see them or, or, you know, uh, as indicating opportunities lost, but we can also see them as indicating opportunities that can be created. Uh, let me leave it very broadly at that. And thank you, Lata. Uh, thank you. Uh, has disappeared, so I'm afraid you're the you're are the chair now. Okay, well, so Bonnie, can I ask you <laughs> to uh, 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 to give us an overview of the current situation, and then I'd like it to ask Jawan to perhaps pick up on what are uh, uh, what is the thinking of uh, youth in Afghanistan. Uh, many of whom are very active in uh, different peace processes and civil society groups as well. Okay, well, thank, Radha, thank you, and thanks to the International Center for organizing this. And more, more than that, thanks to the Cocker Foundation and the Heart of Asia Society for uh, bringing out this very important book. Let me just say a few words about the book and its relevance. Uh, the book is a set of essays by uh, a, a, a very impressive array of scholars and practitioners, um, but it is based on an exchange of letters that took place between President Najibullah of Afghanistan and, uh, pre and Professor Hassan Kakar, a historian who was at that time living in exile in Pakistan and then in the, in the United States, and who had been imprisoned in Afghanistan for several years uh, under uh, Najibullah's predecessor, Babrak Karmal. Um, the, and it takes place at a time after the completion of the withdrawal of the Soviet troops, after the Battle of Jalalabad, when the Mujahideen and their supporters in Pakistan, U.S., and Saudi Arabia, and in Al-Qaeda had tested the proposition that the government would, would collapse rapidly after the withdrawal of troops and Najibullah had shown that even without the presence of Soviet troops, uh, the government uh, could survive, um, especially because of the large amount of military and, and commodity assistance that it continued to receive. Um, so the question, at the same time, it was clear that the government dispensation in Afghanistan had to change. And the discussion between President Najibullah and Professor Kakar was about uh, how that should go about, that should take place. That's why President Najibullah was reaching out to the country's leading thinkers, intellectuals uh, uh, abroad who had been alienated from his regime to try to see if he could form some kind of a consensus with them about the transition. Now, the big, uh, the big difference, the, uh, uh, there are several things that are in common between that period and now, and there are several things that are very different. The thing that is in common is one thing that is in common is that the um, major power, I want to say superpower, powers are not so super anymore, but the major power that had had troops in Afghanistan, um, then the Soviet Union, now the United States, has announced its intention to leave. The United States is in the process of leaving. Um, the Afghan government, then as now, was very dependent on financial and material assistance for its basic functioning and particularly for the security uh, services at that time on the Soviet Union, now on the United States. Um, the Afghan state was factionalized, uh, probably more now than it was at that time. Um, and uh, therefore, the position of the president was extremely important as the one figure that was holding the state together. A lot of the discussion between President Najibullah and Professor Kakar is over how to organize a political transition uh, from one government to another 
while maintaining the, st the structure of the state, which is the same problem that we are facing today. Uh, and the, therefore, they discussed a great deal about, with, about whether there should be an interim government. Najibullah took a position similar to what President Ghani is taking today, that <clears throat> an interim government that is at least one that is imposed from outside uh, would uh, destabilize Afghanistan, make it impossible to carry out the transition. President Cocker took the position that Taliban are taking today, in effect, that the current government is not legitimate enough to oversee the transition, and therefore some kind of an interim government uh, is required. Now, obviously, this, the status of the two governments uh, are very, very different. But let's bear in mind now, but let's look at the international context. Um, there is a superficial resemblance that I mentioned, namely the withdrawal of the major power that had military forces in the country. But <clears throat> something happened after the, the dialogue between President Najibullah and Professor Kakar that neither of them anticipated and which was decisive. And therefore, they did not discuss it. And that was not just the withdrawal, but the collapse of the Soviet Union. That's very important. It's often, it's sometimes overlooked. It's such an extraordinary event. And it's something that, uh, of course, the United States has its internal political crisis. And who knows what would have happened if the rioters in the Capitol on January 6th had succeeded. That was an attempt at a coup, like the coup that took place in Moscow in, uh, night, in August 1991 and led ultimately to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. But in the United case of the United States, the coup attempt failed. And mm -hmm. Uh, the government is still functioning, and uh, likely it, it, it will continue to do so. And therefore, whether it may, to what extent it maintains its commitments to assist the Afghan government or not, it will still be present politically and diplomatically. That's very important. Remember, in 1992, um, when the UN tried to install the interim government in Afghanistan, there was no Soviet Union. There was no one who could pick up the telephone or fly in uh, uh, and who had been uh, so, who had been aiding Najibullah or General Dostum or the various other actors in uh, in the what was then the Watan Party, the former PDPA, um, and try to influence them. And the whole process had been predicated on coordination between the United States and the Soviet Union. Now today, what's different? First of all, is that the international system is more multipolar, or at least if it's bipolar, it's two different actors. It's the United States and China. And the rise in chi of China, and to some extent the rise of India in particular, have very significantly changed the environment in the region in ways that we don't take account of often enough. The United States does not have the same level of predominant power that it did in the 1980s and 1990s. And that has not only changed the relationship of the United States to the other countries in the region, very importantly, it has changed the status of Pakistan. Because Pakistan, which was the, was the base then for the armed opposition to President Najibullah and is the base now for the armed opposition to President Ghani and the current system, uh, at that time was much more dependent on the United States than it is today. Because today, uh, China is actually a peer competitor of the United States. And Pakistan has uh, its relationship with China is there anything more important than its relationship with the United States. That has actually empowered Pakistan more in its relationship to India and, uh, to, Af and to Afghanistan, while at the same time imposed certain limits on it because pa uh, China is, abs is not going to support an Islamist agenda in the region, which is against its... Uh, its uh, security interests. Nonetheless, it does support uh, certain interests of the Pakistani state. Um, and that, uh, uh, that means that there is now a much more uh, uh, multipolar form of attempted coordination. You may have seen last week, there was a meeting of the uh, expanded troika, US, Russia, China, and Pakistan, and we hope that Iran will join that soon, which issued a fairly extensive and detailed statement about how to reach peace in Afghanistan. Um, so the question now is, uh, we're managing a withdrawal of US troops as we were managing this withdrawal of Soviet troops at that time. But the United States, unlike the Soviet Union, will remain diplomatically, economically present. And other actors are now, other international actors are much more important. Finally, let's remember, Rada referred to the youth, that the society of Afghanistan is completely different 
Now, not that it's not, of course, it's Islamic. There are many traditions that are important. Tribal and ethnic identities are important, but it is a connected society. It is not a fragmented and disconnected society as it was at that time. Uh, over 6 million cell phones connected to the internet. Uh, Afghans are connected to each other and connected to the international community in ways that simply did not exist in 1989 and 1990. And I think that creates a much different political situation internally, uh, which we have not taken fully into account. We The withdrawal of the troops is very visible. The uh, lowering of aid is somewhat more or less visible, but also taking place. But the rise of connectivity not just within the region, but among the people of Afghanistan and between the people of Afghanistan and the rest of the world is a phenomenon which I think will have a fundamental transformative effect on the nature of the upcoming political transition. Uh, I won't predict what that effect will be, but I think it means it would be much more difficult for any group to simply seize power by force and think that they can take control of the country. Thank you very much, Barney. I'm sorry I, I disappeared again because of uh, I don't know what. So I didn't hear the last uh, part of uh, uh, Rada. But what I feel uh, that both Rada and Barney have told us is that the region today is all important. Uh, of course, what is happening, you know, Barney has again said that Afghanistan, Afghanistan is another country today from what it was in, in at the end of the 1980s. Uh, but the region now is much more important. The Soviet Union has disappeared. And I think that the, the Americans, through their own decision and through the changes that are uh, taking place uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the region, uh, the Americans are uh, less interested they are still a very, very big player. But I think the region, the, the role of the region has improved. I will go as far as to say that uh, in addition to the Afghans themselves, they have a role, they have a responsibility. They cannot uh, you know, say it all comes from outside. But I think that the, you know, the region, and to, 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 name, to name some of them, India, Pakistan, Iran, and now China are going to make it possible for peace to happen in Afghanistan or for this situation to continue or even worsen. The, the, the region is, 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 all, is all, 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 all important. Um, now, let's hear perhaps from uh, you know, the man who has coordinated this book and uh, uh, you know, made, I mean, helped make sure that we do have a book now that is uh, in print and that is, uh, I think, on sale. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Jawan, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about the book and then we hear from uh, Jawid uh, the view from Afghanistan? Well, first of all, let me thank you, Radha, and thank you for the India Center for putting this uh, event together during these uh, extraordinary times, actually, in India. So uh, I extend my, my, my prayers and, and thoughts with people of India. Uh, but uh, to go beyond that, I mean, uh, Professor Rubin talked about uh, most of the things, actually, that I have uh, written down in my own notes uh, to talk about that. So I won't go and repeat about that. I'm going to make a couple of uh, specific points, uh, but before I make the, that, let me uh, talk about like the big framework of, of, of the volume. Obviously, we have 22 essays uh, in this volume, and we uh, try to divide that into three broad sections, and one that uh, the first section deals with an analysis of, of, of the letters themselves, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, we have uh, people uh, from the States, uh, from uh, South Asia, fr from Afghanistan, who have actually gone deep and, and, and read and analyzed these letters from different perspectives. And then uh, we have a second section in the book that deals with like themes, uh, state society relationships. So they deal with the media, they deal uh, with uh, civil society and, and, and development and uh, 
state formation in Afghanistan. The third section, which, uh, which deals with a kind of wider regional aspect of, of, of the war and, and peacemaking in Afghanistan, uh, is also like expansive. So together we have 22 ACEs. Uh, uh, we have like several contributors uh, who are actually female. That's very important, uh, uh, something that we considered when we called, uh, when we extended uh, our invitations to all the, the respective contributors. So that's, uh, that, that's something to take into consideration. And, and that's important because uh, as I have said it uh, elsewhere, uh, uh, the, the, the field of Afghanistan studies has been dominated by men, and, and that's something very important that we have to make sure, especially at this time, to, to hear uh, f from women as well, and, and, and that's something uh, that's so unique about this, uh, this volume. But uh, to go kind of uh, beyond the, the book and, and, and talk about uh, something that I have uh, kind of framed it in my, in my uh, notes is sort of like South Asia in Afghanistan and Afghanistan in South Asia. That's how I will like look at the region as, as uh, other colleagues have talked about it. And, and the point I'm trying to make is uh, uh, that is important to kind of uh, link it to the larger situation uh, that is, uh, true of Afghanistan, and that is, uh, uh, my understanding is, I'm, I'm a historian, uh, peace has never been a priority in Afghanistan for the international community, and I, I still believe in that. I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, that peace has become a priority even for the region. I mean, uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is that we do have, uh, this is not a sort of like a blame game here, but we have like solid evidence of serious like military and political interventions in the country, uh, not now, but in the 1990s and before. And, and that is something, we, if, if you read like the letters, obviously the, the three letters exchanged between uh, President Najibullah and Professor Cocker, in these two letters, uh, they are very specific actually. They do focus on like, two aspects of the war and, and peacemaking in Afghanistan. One is uh, obviously the part uh, that deals with Afghans themselves, and they are very explicit about that, that Afghans are not doing their job. They are not outreaching to each other. They are not talking to each other. I mean, uh, uh, Professor Barney uh, talked about uh, that point. Mujahideen never recognized the legitimacy of President uh, Najibullah. And uh, I, I think one thing I should actually add here uh, that uh, that hasn't been mentioned, in addition to this English volume, we also like produced a, a, a volume in Farsi and Pashto, which is which is quite actually uh, interesting because in that volume we have contributions from like a number of like former Mujahideen and uh, members and, and then members of Communist Party of Afghanistan. In, in those uh, essays actually, we can clearly see from Mujahideens themselves that they say that maybe we made a mistake. We should have made actually peace with Pro President Najibullah. So that is something uh, to take into consideration, very important. That's, uh, that's uh, one thing. So uh, it, it kind of, I, I'm not like one of those people who, who come up with like solutions. I don't know what is exactly the solution for Afghanistan, but as far as I understand and think is, that uh, it's not 10 years war, it's not 20 years war, 40 years of war have been going on in Afghanistan. Afghans have been involved deeply in it and internationals have been involved deeply in it. So that's something to take into consideration. And in these specific three letters, actually, uh, both President Najibullah uh, and, and Cocker are, are again explicit about uh, that intervention. And that is something I think uh, crucial. So if you're going to see peace in Afghanistan, it's not just going to come through Afghans. That's obvious. Yes, Afghans can get together uh, probably and, and, and make peace. But if, if, if we continue uh, to see international intervention in that country, whether that's in the form of military or whether in other form, it's going to be problematic. And, and peace is not going to be sustainable. And in the letters, uh, at least in Professor Parker's letter, uh, for example, Pakistan and Soviet Union are singled out. I mean, they are described as half of the problem in Afghanistan. 
And, and, and that is something serious. I, I won't go into the details of that because uh, Hataksa will talk about that uh, in details. Uh, and, and we have a wonderful contribution. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Kumar, you you have uh, contributed uh, a wonderful essay that we don't have that regional regional framework for Afghanistan to make peace. So that, that's something, if region is important, of, of what region we are talking about. Are we talking about region, uh, South Asia, are we talking about Central Asia, are we talking about Iran? So Iran must be heavily involved. Uh, I mean, it shouldn't, we shouldn't deal like politically here. I mean, Iran has not only massive interest in Afghanistan, but Iran has massive influence. Iran has been part of Afghanistan, uh, not now, but for like there for, for centuries, uh, and, and Afghanistan has been uh, there. So it's very important to take into consideration and, and I, my, my own understanding is, and I'm seeing this uh, uh, again in the kind of international media and in the regional media, that this war in Afghanistan is being uh, kind of portrayed again, uh, quote unquote, as so, some sort of Afghan. That's not true, actually. Uh, we, we should kind of just move beyond that. There, there is nothing just uh, Afghan about this war. And, and that's something that needs to become public, understood, and, 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 and appreciate that. I, I mean, uh, so we, we, have, we have to deal with that. I, I think, uh, uh, rather you ask me about uh, the youth, I, I wish I was, I was young to tell you anymore, and I'm not in Afghanistan, so yes, I can tell you Afghanistan has changed. Uh, yes, I, I can give you examples of, uh, uh, like, girls and, and boys going to schools, and I can, and I can tell you that, yes, uh, maybe less than 60% of uh, Afghanistan population or more than that or, or, or young people like under like 18 or something. But uh, those are uh, statistics that are out so we can, uh, we, we, can, we can see them. And yes, Afghanistan has changed, but also the region has changed, the world has changed. So uh, on one hand, while uh, uh, the internationals uh, have to recognize that part, but Afghans themselves also have to recognize that, that the world has changed and they have to be prepared for that world. So it's going to be, uh, I should actually now use uh, Professor Robin's kind of argument that it's not going to be easy to just simply transition from a state of war and, and peace in Afghanistan. But one way to just kind of transition yeah. probably is to at least recognize that Afghan people deserve peace, not just in words, but actually in action. It's real, and it's 40 years war, so the society has been traumatized, and, and it's real, and, and it's real, and, and we know this uh, in, our, uh, in the lives of our family members, and our friends, and in our neighbors, uh, in our villages, so uh, it's very obvious, uh, and that's something uh, dear to me, and, and to kind of, uh, since uh, this event is being organized in India, and I'm a South Asianist, and I, by training, I'm a medievalist. So I know more about medieval South Asia than, than contemporary South Asia. From my little interactions or, 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 or deep interactions with uh, people from South Asia in Pakistan, in India, I think, yes, we know there is like more engagement now at the regional level between South Asia and Afghanistan, let's say India now and India in the 1990s. But actually that, that connectivity now is kind of like policy oriented, not public oriented. I don't understand, I don't believe that people now in India know more about Afghanistan than they used to know in the 1990s. And I have, I, I have, I have met people actually, they, have told me that they used to come for vacation in the 1990s and 80s to Kabul and Afghanistan. You, you won't see that uh, anymore. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is uh, we need uh, like much more like uh, broader and wider engagement, uh, like people to people. And, and, and somehow, I don't know whether this is going to be possible, but somehow we have to come that Afghanistan needs to be kept away from the so-called Indo-Pak rivalry in the region. Somehow we have to find a way. Yes, Kashmir is important uh, for, for people in Kashmir. Yes, Kashmir is important for India. Yes, important 
for Pakistan. It's important for Afghanistan, but Afghanistan is also important for Afghan. So that needs to be uh, yeah. understood. And so I, I, I won't. Uh, uh, I, I will just try to conclude uh, my, my remarks by saying that my understanding is that we need to find ways to prioritize peace in Afghanistan. And that's something that Afghans have to do it at the local, national level, and uh, Afghans and, and people in the region have to do it at a, at a regional level and then at an international level. So something that I'm interested in uh, and, and something that, that's also very important. So uh, I, I, would, I would just end there, and uh, obviously. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. You have made some very, very important uh, points. You know, in, in September 1999, when I resigned from my first assignment in Afghanistan, I told the Security Council that uh, you are not interested in Afghanistan. You, you sent me to Afghanistan to try and see if we can, if the United Nations can help make peace, but you are not interested in Afghanistan at all. Uh, because it's a faraway country, it's a landlocked, it's poor, uh, it's of no interest, of no, no direct interest to any of you. But you are wrong, because one day it will uh, blow in your face. It has. And in a way, it has continued to be, uh, you know, a, a very, very uh, painful uh, thorn in the flesh of, of everybody. So you are right, people. And you see, I mean, the point I was trying to make when I spoke of the importance of the region and neighbors of Afghanistan, the people who have influence, you have mentioned Iran, Iran has influence, India has influence, Pakistan has influence. The people who have influence, countries who have influence, are the very countries who can also be spoilers. So it is for them to decide, is there national interest in making peace in Afghanistan or in maintaining a state of war? Uh, that is very, it's a very, very important question that, uh, you know, India, China, uh, 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 Iran, Pakistan have got to answer for themselves to, to their people and, 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 and also to, to the rest. Uh, so now may, maybe Javid and we will uh, leave Mr. Rafa to, 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 the, to the end. Yes, uh, Javid. Am I mute? Okay. Well, Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the India International Center. Thank you to Radha for organizing this. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. And um, may I also just say that my, uh, um, my thoughts and prayers are with, um, with um, the, the many, many, many friends that, that we have in India and they're going through a, a difficult time. Um, it's, um, it's also an, um, um, in order for me, uh, because I think I'm, I'm not only just um, um, here on behalf of Heart of Asia Society as, um, as, as one of the, the two um, sponsors or organizers of the volume, uh, but also for the Kakar History Foundation, um, uh, who is chairman, uh, Kaun Kakar is not here uh, with us today, uh, to just say um, what an honor it has been uh, to work with these, um, with these uh, amazing leaders who are um, joining us on this uh, on this panel as well, it's been uh, wonderful also to work with the many many others who are not here uh, but who contributed essays. As Jawan Sher said, it's been uh, uh, it, it's an extremely it's been an extremely enriching experience, and we're grateful and we're really proud um, and honored that we've been able to uh, to put it out at this uh, important time. So thank you, and um, thank you also, Jawan, for the wonderful work that you have done on, on putting this volume together, on editing it. Um, I, I, I won't say anything about it anymore because I think both Barney and Jawan have covered the, um, uh, you know, the whole sort of relevance of the book uh, to today's um, context. Um, what I would probably say a, a few words would be more uh, just following on from what uh, Ambassador Brahimi um, said about the importance of the region and various others as well. 
uh, highlighted that. Uh, but I think it's, you, you can't really enter the conversation about the role of the region without first um, maybe um, uh, very, very uh, briefly um, uh, assessing where the U.S. right now stands. Uh, because the role of the U.S. in Afghanistan or the presence of the U.S. and, and, and I make use U.S. in a very sort of in, in, in broad sense, not just referring to uh, to the United States, but to, to its allies, to NATO um, and the entire sort of international um, uh, co coalition or, or alliance that uh, that has been involved in Afghanistan over the last two decades. Uh, their presence in Afghanistan has been uh, one of the most determining factors of the region's relationship with Afghanistan. So, uh, so I think when you talk about the, 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 re the region, the region's role um, in current times, uh, and the, particularly in the peace process, uh, let's see where the U.S. stands uh, now and what has changed. And obviously, uh, the latest development in terms of the announcement on troop uh, on the troop withdrawal. Um, has had many impacts, uh, but I think one uh, very obvious thing that we are seeing, or we have seen it over the past few weeks, is a um, is a perception that the U.S. role uh, overall in Afghanistan and in the region, but I think specifically with regards to the peace process, is going to be diminished. Um, uh, now, that that is uh, we've seen it in, in statements. That's um, that that's what the perception is here from where I'm talking in Kabul. Uh, this is the perception. I think we are also hearing that the Taliban would um, um, and they've, they've, they've a unique kind of relationship with the U.S. Um, as you all know, um, but they probably will view uh, the U.S. role with um, uh, with with sort of less seriousness now uh, that all the leverage that existed is is off the table now. And I think same is going to be true uh, in the region. Uh, the region sees that role diminished. Uh, the important thing is, well, uh, before I maybe discuss the region, to just say that, that this is, is not helpful. Uh, and uh, the U.S. does have a positive role to play, uh, including in the peace process. And it's important to regain and, uh, whatever leverage that's lost as a result of the military withdrawal has to be regained in other areas. Uh, and, and, maybe, um, and the examples are, well, I mean, obviously, uh, I think one of the speakers referred to diplomacy. Uh, and one of the important areas in which the U.S. role has to be strengthened from now on even more uh, would be in the area of, of diplomacy. Um, whether it's diplomacy with, with, with Afghanistan, with the, uh, the uh, with Afghans uh, on the two sides uh, of the conflict right now, or whether it's diplomacy at the regional level, because I think that's been uh, that's been one of the weak uh, on, on the, the weaker uh, sort of parts of the uh, of of the diplomatic effort led by Ambassador Khalilzad over the last two years. Is that at the regional level? The, um, I think it has um, it has been inadequate, uh, which which explains uh, the situation right now with, um, uh, in terms of the regional involvement. Uh, the the U.S. Uh, role uh, influence is also very important in terms of the um, you know its continued engagement with Afghanistan. The funding of the ANDSF is is going to be uh, uh, hugely important. Uh, uh, and some sort of uh, we obviously you know we we acknowledge that positive statements are being made uh, that there will be continued partnership there will be continued support for Afghanistan there will be funding for ANDSF um, but uh, we have also learned that unless uh, unless these commitments are uh, in sort of enshrined or embedded in some sort of a, a, a multilateral. Uh, framework, a uh, cooperation framework, um, it, it's hard to really take it seriously and it's hard to um, count on it as a predictable commitment. So I think some sort of, I, I understand that there is some discussion at, the, at NATO about, about whether there may be some sort of a mission, uh, a post-RS, post-resolute support mission that could be um, 
uh, that, that could capture that. Obviously, I'm um, not talking about continued uh, military presence in any way, but whatever commitment there is, whether it's in financial uh, contribution, whether it's uh, some support to the Afghan National Security Forces, uh, training, whatever the, the, that's possible, would be good to have it in some sort of a multilateral framework rather than um, rather than these bilateral statements of, of commitment. Uh, briefly about the region, uh, it's much more complex when you talk about the region. Uh, some uh, falsely uh, assume that there is consensus in the region behind peace in Afghanistan, and they basically say so because they hear all the statements that are made, uh, you know, these conferences in which uh, foreign ministers from all countries come and then they make very similar statements. In fact, it's quite easy to cut and paste and, uh, and just change the names of foreign ministers. Um, a lot of times when it comes to peace, because who opposes peace? Who would say that they don't support peace in Afghanistan? Um, but I think it's only, you only have to, you know, scratch the surface a little bit, go a little deeper, and then you see that the, um, that the, the picture underneath this sort of veneer of, of, uh, of, uh, of consensus is, is, is fractured. Um, and it's fractured because, um, because the, uh, despite um, very obvious areas of common interest, um, they, the, the region fundamentally disagrees about how to uh, seek uh, the uh, 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 protection of those interests. So, for example, there, there is obviously the, uh, the you know you could, you could assume uh, that the fact that uh, Afghan should be peaceful uh, would be something that the region would would agree on. Everybody, um, you would also be, uh, I think, right to to assume that there were there's um, there's uh, there's a common there's a shared fear about uh, about the prospects or, or the consequences of of, uh, of a collapse, a state collapse in Afghanistan, of civil war that uh, will will easily spill over the, uh, uh, to the region uh, that there uh, people are concerned about it. So and so 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 why can cannot those sort of common denominators cannot be translated as the basis for consensus building? Uh, on the Afghan peace, why is that the region has really not uh, been able to to um, to play a role and and bring it about um, uh, and to uh, on, uh, you know translate it into into real leverage and influence at, at the negotiation table? Uh, because I think, as I said, uh, number one is that they don't agree on strategy uh, on on how this could be done. Uh, or the other thing is is that fundamentally the region has, has failed to, to, to detach Afghanistan from, from, the, uh, from the dual strategic relationships that they have between themselves. The India-Pakistan question was mentioned before, but there are also others. That's not the only one. Um, and I think the other, the other thing uh, that's a pro that's been a problem in terms of region's role is, um, is that they don't individually, these countries individually have, uh, have have a view about what their role should be uh, or could be, but they don't agree on, uh, um, there have never been an effort to have a multilateral position on Afghanistan. Uh, these, um, you know, there, there are these bilateral discussions, there are trilateral, there are quadrilateral, there is, uh, and, and then obviously with, you know, with the engagement of the US and others, you also see this Troika and, um, and, and many other formats but the region has uh, lacked and still lacks. To, I mean, isn't, isn't it surprising that with the, in the middle of this uh, very, very intense situation right now, with the region being deeply involved, we still do not have um, as a sort of a proper, um, uh, consistent uh, platform where regional countries can convene and discuss uh, Afghanistan. Uh, such a uh, at the international level you you have examples but not at the regional level um so that's the situation of the region for you and very briefly i, I know i've probably taken my time but, but very briefly but how could uh, how maybe we could uh, we could cooperate um it's very important that to to, to recognize that the departure of the us um militarily uh, 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 speaking 
from, from Afghanistan uh, is an opportunity for the region. Uh, for, for many, many years, for the past two decades, the region has seen U.S. military presence uh, as, as, well, some have seen it as threat, some as uh, not so. Um, but, but one thing that they have agreed on is that it's a variable. It's a variable factor. And to, to have a, a one variable less means more clarity. Uh, so therefore, it is an opportunity. Um, the other thing is that the US, as I was mentioning, I think this sort of diplomacy is now uh, uh, the you know, center stage again. Uh, but this should be used to, I would say, the US should use its influence to um, to expand that consensus, some of those basic areas of common agreement that exist uh, across uh, the region, uh, and expand on it. Like the fact that troops are no longer there, the fact that everybody agrees, at least notionally, with peace, or, or everybody sees the threat of uh, or, you know, counterterrorism and the, uh, the future of counterterrorism as an important priority. Those could be expanded. I think there are also other things that could, that could be used. Like, I don't you know, which region, which country in the region would support the return of the Islamic Emirate? Um, I, I don't know. I can't find one. So therefore, why can't we use these um, examples of common uh, common interest as the basis for that yes. region consensus that we're building? You have asked very good questions, uh, Javed. Uh, perhaps you will give a chance now to Mr. Afrasiab to uh, say something. And... I'm sure that he will try to answer some of your questions about the role of the region. Please go ahead. Very much, esteemed Lakhtar Barahimi Sahib, honorable panelists, dear friends. First of all, I would also like to thank India International Center for organizing today's webinar. And I would also thank Akar Foundation and Heart of Asia Society for publishing the book. Well, uh, I will be brief because uh, very learned and experienced people have already spoken. Uh, I would just uh, make a few points. My first point is a comparison between the Geneva Accords in 1988, April 1988, and the Doha Agreement. Uh, which was probably in 2020. Uh, you see, the first was fig leaf for the Soviet Union to withdraw from Afghanistan uh, and save its fees. And this Doha agreement is a fig leaf for the United States. Uh, but if we compare the two, I think uh, the Geneva cards, although they were, they were meant to be violated and they were violated, uh, but uh, they, I mean, content-wise, they were better than this Doha agreement. Unfortunately, uh, this Doha agreement has systematically weakened uh, the, and uh, isolated the Afghan state and the Republican system. And it has legitimized and empowered Taliban. That's how Taliban, uh, without giving anything, have got legitimacy, released their prisoners, and are now demanding uh, their emirate, are imposing their emirate militarily uh, on Afghanistan. And I think uh, this framework of Doha agreement was uh, flawed from day one. We, we have been saying this. You see, uh, when there is negotiations between state and non-state players, the first thing which is demanded by the state players is, first of all, renouncing of violence, in this case, terrorism. And the second is recognition of the rate of the state. Unfortunately, these things were not even mentioned in the Doha agreement. Similarly, the Taliban's sanctuaries were also not uh, a part of the agreement. Uh, so in a way, uh, this, this uh, uh, flawed process, unfortunately, has landed uh, Afghanistan and the entire region into a, in a very difficult situation. This brings me to Taliban. For example, we know Taliban in the past 1990s, everyone of us know that they were uh, the one, it was an edifice, edifice for uh, this terrorist syndicate, which launched terrorist attacks in four continents in 1990s. You see, th these were serious things. Of course, the 9-11 was the most serious, but even before that, they had launched attacks in Asia, Africa, 
uh, America and Europe. But you see, they, they, they have never been, uh, they, they have never renounced those, those things. And uh, they, they still not only uh, uh, own, the, own those, their, owns their past, but they also, even today, have not been able to cut the relations with Al-Qaeda. Even uh, it, it is part of Doha agreement, but the reports that have emerged from UN and even US state agencies reveal that uh, Al-Qaeda is there. And there are thousands of uh, fighters fighting alongside Taliban even today. There are thousands of Pakistanis. We receive dead bodies every day uh, from Afghanistan, pre President war going on in Afghanistan, from Hilman, from uh, uh, Ghazni, from other pro provinces of Afghanistan. So uh, uh, Taliban have not even uh, uh, shown their intention uh, to, to uh, change their attitude or their relationship with other uh, terrorist groups. So uh, it brings us to another uh, question, because it seems that the U.S. is convinced that after degrading Al-Qaeda, uh, it's not, uh, uh, I mean, the regional terrorism is not U.S. headache. Uh, although, personally, I think it, it, it is uh, it is U.S. headache, because unfortunately, it, it can grow like it grew in 1990s. Even at that time, not many people were uh, agreeing, but then it happened. But in any, in any case, they, it seems that they, they think so. So uh, it, it brings us to the regional question, the question of this region uh, to face uh, terrorism and to face the situation which is, uh, uh, which, which is uh, developing in our region. This brings me to Pakistan. Pakistani generals are not anymore in denial about the presence of Taliban sanctuaries because this is uh, uh, their strength. It gives them uh, leverage in international uh, arena, and it also strengthens them uh, politically uh, in the hybrid system which is prevailing in Pakistan. But you see, there is a very real danger of Pakistan getting more radicalized with the ascendancy of Taliban in Afghanistan. We are witnessing regrouping of different Taliban and terrorist groups on the east of Divran line. And it seems Taliban's plan B uh, is uh, being uh, gradually implemented, which they had mentioned in Doha, that if the negotiation process collapses, they will have military uh, attacks. And this, it seems they are going, going for that. Now, uh, Pakistan has 36,000 religious seminaries and uh, the syllabus and other things have not been reformed. Uh, other uh, structures uh, which were used in terrorism in 1980s and 90s are still intact. So there is a real threat of Pakistan uh, getting radicalized. Uh, uh, Radha mentioned about recent uh, initiative for Pak India negotiations. Yes, uh, uh, the negotiations were started at the behest of General Bajwa, the chief of army staff, who is the uh, most powerful person in the hybrid system. And Imran Khan started, the Prime Minister Imran Khan started this process on his behest. But then immediately there was resistance. And in 48 hours, uh, the government had to uh, take back its words. And in the last three days, uh, I have seen uh, attack from the hawks, uh, and, and uh, I see retreat uh, in the camp which was uh, talking about uh, uh, normalization of relations with India. So that, uh, with the rise of Taliban, this trend can grow and it can re really create threats. As far as China is concerned, I think Chinese were expecting that uh, the world will not treat Taliban the way they have. They thought China will uh, sort of uh, uh, integrate them in the CPAC uh, pro projects and China will divert their energy to economic activities, uh, bring them to peaceful activities. But probably Chinese must be uh, also disappointed and concerned to see. Uh, but what but, but, uh, uh, Professor Ban Rubin said that uh, Pakistan is uh, in a stronger position, I, I will uh, a little bit disagree with that with great respect. I would say that uh, Pakistan is in a very bad shape uh, because of uh, economic conditions. Uh, Pakistan is an economic mess. 
it is very heavily dependent on IMF. China cannot really be an alternative for uh, American aid to Pakistan because Chinese are giving loans and those loans are to be paid back. Pakistan is juggling with uh, 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 short-term economic policies, uh, taking uh, loans from Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates and IMF. Uh, but you see, it is very difficult for Pakistan to uh, be uh, to violate Western pressure at this point of time. Uh, if if the West wants Pakistan to change its uh, attitude, uh, there, there is a lot of leverage that can be brought. But the question is, will the West bring this pressure, or will the West like to keep the pot boiling in Eurasia? Uh, because of the uh, emerging Cold War in Eurasia, as was mentioned by Professor Barney Trubin and other speakers. Th 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 that is uh, a, a very big uh, question. But I think uh, the Russians have also jumped in the fray, uh, believing that U.S. will not be able to uh, take the process to logical conclusion, and Russians would like to replace American in Afghanistan, but unfortunately, that is also uh, that seems to be more of daydreaming because the ground realities uh, are totally different. So I, I, I think uh, the U.S. should uh, keep uh, working with uh, powers the way U.S. worked with China uh, uh, under President Obama, uh, with Russia, with Iran, with Pakistan. I think that that is very important, and that that seems to be uh, a reasonable solution. And the question of sanctuaries should be raised so that Taliban behave and they come down from the pedestal from which they seem to be dreaming about revival of their emirate, which of course a change uh, will not accept, I am I'm confident uh, it will not work, but it, will, it can lead to civil war, it can lead to destruction, which will have consequences for the region and for the world. I thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed. You have brought us back uh, to uh, reality with some very frightening uh, possibilities if uh, everybody doesn't do what they need to do. Uh, it's not possible to sum up what you have said. I think uh, perhaps we, we, we have agreed and that we are extremely grateful to uh, Kaon and his friends, and the, you know, the Heart of Asia, the foundation, the Kakarko Foundation, uh, for publishing this book. We hope that this book will receive great attention inside Afghanistan, in the region around Afghanistan, and in the rest of the world. The other thing is that uh, peace in Afghanistan is extremely important, not only for the Afghan people, of course, most of all for the Afghan people, but also for their neighbors. And their neighbors have got to be a little bit more uh, responsible, dare I say, than they have been in the past, uh, and, and, and perhaps work together and with others to help Afghanistan make peace and uh, not war. Uh, I will now pass it on to Rada for, uh, to, uh, you know, I haven't said myself at the beginning because I wasn't there, how grateful we all are to the Indian National Center for uh, hosting us and uh, how much we sympathize with the Indian people in uh, this, uh, uh, suffering from this pandemic, like and more than a lot of other people around, uh, around the world. So I, I thank you, apologize for uh, being late and disturbing a little bit your uh, proceedings. And Radha, it's up to you, to, it's uh, all over to you to, to conclude. And maybe, maybe ask a couple of questions, uh, see if we can uh, uh, reply to a couple of questions. Radha, it's to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lakhtar. Um, there have been a series of questions, uh, the bulk of which revolve around this all-important issue of what happens uh, when the U.S. withdraws. Uh, will there be a vacuum? 
will different actors step into the vacuum? <clears throat> what will be uh, uh, the international uh, reactions? Um, how is the region going to behave? Uh, uh, are we going to see again a polarization amongst regional actors? Uh, some of these questions, I would say, have been answered by several uh, of the panelists. Some of them uh, are, are impossible to answer. We cannot say, will there be a vacuum? Uh, at the moment, it seems that uh, we are in a period of uh, uh, innumerable uh, collective and bilateral and trilateral and quadrilateral uh, discussions without any uh, clear um, consensus recommendations emerging. Uh, so what we can say is that this is a time when we would hope that there would be far more active and intense uh, discussion, uh, especially amongst regional, by which I mean neighbors of Afghanistan, uh, um, to, to start thinking concretely about what they can do to try to prevent a vacuum and try to prevent uh, conflict re-emerging, whether in Afghanistan or within the region at large. Um, so uh, that, I think, is an issue that hopefully is going to uh, 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 gain more and more attention in the coming days. Um, <clears throat> other questions. Uh, one of the questions was uh, whether there will be a relapse into ethnic conflict. Um, I don't think there will, but uh, that is a question, I think, for other panelists to address. There were several questions specifically for you, uh, Lakhtar. I don't know whether you particularly want to answer them. They're also quite general questions. Uh, relating to your experience as a negotiator uh, in the past and how would you see it uh, uh, today? There is one question. And finally, of course, please. Uh, there is one question perhaps worth uh, trying to answer, and that is that why, uh, whether we try to invite the Taliban to the Bonn conference. Uh, we didn't. Right. You know, November to, to, uh, 2001, uh, it was unthinkable to think of inviting the Taliban. The, the picture that was in everybody's mind was that of two towers in, in New York. Uh, but where the, I believe now the big mistake we made was in January, February, March 2002, when we were in Kabul. It was a very simple question. We asked too, too timidly, and there was unanimity telling us, forget about it. That question is, the Taliban have been defeated. They have been routed, as a matter of fact. They have disappeared. A lot of people have been killed. A lot of people have been arrested. But hundreds of thousands of Taliban have just melted uh, in, in the country. Where, where did they go? Uh, this question, uh, you know, some ha have asked, but there was unanimity. Uh, uh, Russia, India, uh, uh, Iran, the United States all said, forget about it. The Taliban are gone. We don't have to worry about them. That was, that was a very, very big mistake. Talking to the Taliban in 2002 would have been much, much better than talking to the Taliban today. Rada? Yeah. Mm. Which adds, which adds, of course, to the problems uh, that Afghanistan will face quite soon. Um, I, I was thinking that perhaps we could just each of us take a couple of minutes to make concluding remarks based on the questions that we've seen. Um, the second set of questions revolved around the issue of aid. Uh, uh, social and economic aid for social and economic development in Afghanistan, which again obviously will depend to some extent on the security situation there. Uh, 
I just want to say that uh, my concluding remark is that the most critical uh, element is going to be how will the uh, Afghanistan security and defense forces integrate if the Taliban is going to integrate with them in, in which way is this going to be made possible? Uh, are we going to be thinking about some international uh, um, uh, experts uh, overseeing an integration process? Uh, it's difficult to imagine the Taliban accepting something like that, but in, in the absence of that, how on earth is this integration process going to take place? And of course, without integration, uh, the prospects for security are going to be very dim. Uh, now, when I say that, let me also say that I would again think that the region uh, 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 or the different neighbors of Afghanistan do have to come up with ideas on how to help the security situation. Without that and without some uh, 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 consensus agreement, that the neighbors will not encourage uh, flows of arms and fighters into Afghanistan, which is, of course, a problem that uh, both uh, Dr. Najibullah and Professor Akar highlighted. Uh, the uh, chances of any process of peace taking hold post withdrawal are going to be very dim. Um, should we just go around seeing what are the main questions that require answering. Uh, Barney, you read the questions. Uh, there are some that are specifically related to your knowledge and analysis. Uh, Afrasiab, I think you answered quite a large number of the questions, but you might still wish to say a few words about uh, uh, how a regional conversation by which not just some members of the region, but at least the eight to 10 neighboring heart of Asia countries can come back, can revive a discussion, uh, whether it was you know, on the Istanbul format or whether it was a smaller type of track to civil society, uh, regional discussions that we did at one time at the Delhi Policy Group, uh, whether those initiatives at this point in time could help at all. Uh, is something that perhaps Javed and uh, you could both look at. And finally, let me just say the book is available on Amazon for anyone who's interested in buying it. Barney? Okay, well, thank you. Um, briefly, first, I'll just say that we uh, there, there is a decision point for Pakistan uh, very uh, coming up as... Uh, President Ghani actually highlighted in an article he wrote that came out in Foreign Affairs uh, yesterday, and that is Pakistan has stated, and the Pakistan military has stated, that it does not want the restoral, re restoration of the Islamic Emirate in Afghanistan. It provided sort of resources and sanctuary to the Taliban because of various security concerns it had about the role of India and perhaps because of ra radical currents in the military. Uh, but now... Uh, there are reports, uh, I, maybe they're a little beyond rumors, that the Pakistan military is telling the Taliban that at this point they have to uh, make, make some concessions and that if not, they will meet some consequences. I hesitate to believe that. Of course, one has heard it before. But if there were ever a time when Pakistan might make that decision, it would be now, uh, both because of the change in the situation in Afghanistan and for the reasons that Afar Siyab Khatak mentioned, that is, the, the Pakistan does have that economic vulnerability now and is under pressure from the um, Financial Action Task Force over its support for terrorism. Finally, there's the question of the role of the United Nations. We haven't mentioned that, even though Mr. Brahimi is here. Uh, um, the U U.S. has, uh, of course, UNAMA is still there, headed by SRSG. The U.S. has called for uh, and gotten the appointment of a personal representative of the Secretary General, who will be Mr. Jean Arnaud, uh, to uh, facilitate the peace process. But uh, one aspect, there's one major difference between the U.S. position on the U.N. and uh, uh, the region. That is, the U.S. at first asked the U.N. to convene the powers of the region to try to reach consensus 
And the region, uh, Pakistan opposed that because of the inclusion of India. Russia opposed it because Russia has its own regional process, uh, the Moscow process. Um, and you'll note that in the recent statement by the Troika, the expanded Troika, there was no mention of a regional role for the United Nations. I think this is a serious obstacle because um, the fact is the, what Afrasa referred to as the, the possibility of a renewed, uh, well, let's say great power competition rather than Cold War um, on the Eurasian continent is something that could be very fatal for Afghanistan. If the countries in the region do not reach some kind of multilateral agreement on what they will accept and support in terms of the nature of the Afghan security forces, what will, it be, defend, what will be its defense and supply relationships, uh, whether they will be able to establish some confidence building measures uh, about to uh, alleviate the fear that all of them have of covert action by uh, other powers in the region and so on. And I think that the United Nations could play a very useful facilitating role in this um, uh, if the great powers on the continent, Russia and China in particular, are, are willing to engage with it. It's, so far, it's unclear. It, it seems that they are resisting that. Um, you know, if I may, just on this, you know, the the the, uh, the convening power of the United Nations is uh, cannot be equaled, and one day this everybody will say you know the UN is welcome, but I hope it will not be too late. Uh, so the earlier the UN is given an important role, not a, not just just you know a, a seat around the table, a very important role. Uh, the better for uh, everyone. In 1992, if Benon Sevan had been allowed to start to implement the uh, program that he had worked out with everyone, that everyone had agreed to, uh, perhaps that Afghanistan would have been taken in, 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 a, in a different way. So I, I hope that uh, you know, this opportunity is not missed there once again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Javid, you wanted to say something? Um, I just thought, um, I think there was one question at least, and there are probably more about uh, what will happen and what's the prospect of a, of a civil war. Um, and, and I just wanted to, uh, um, to address that, um, that when I mean, obviously, if uh, I was actually thinking about something very similar this morning myself, when I woke up to a, a glorious, um, sunny Kabul, so peaceful. So, I mean, spring in Kabul is obviously so beautiful; it's incredible. And uh, um, and then and then it rained later on, and it couldn't be a more normal place. I mean, it couldn't be more. Um, um, you know, couldn't be far, uh, more far, uh, far from from those kind of uh, of, of scenarios. Um, but I, but I wish uh, th that I uh, that I thought um, you know that the civil war scenario was unthinkable. I think it's it's very much a uh, uh, very much a possibility, um, especially uh, what we are seeing right now is. Um, uh, is on both sides, in fact, not just from the Taliban side. Um, here uh, in Kabul as well, uh, the peace agenda or the peace sort of uh, uh, process is, is losing momentum uh, very, very rapidly. The cancellation of the Istanbul conference uh, was, a, was, a, was a blow. Um, for whatever reason it was, uh, we won't go into it, but, um, but it shouldn't have been allowed to happen. Um, and now uh, we, in the absence of a, of a roadmap uh, right now to to speak of, the war scenarios are increasingly gaining gaining momentum, uh, gaining ground, and this and 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 I think that's um, and especially with the uh, with the uh, sort of on the other side with, with the, on the U.S. Uh, role, uh, decreasing role, diminish as I mentioned earlier in the peace process. Who who is going to um, to sort of champion a return to this uh, to to that process? 
when Afghans themselves are obviously a part of now part of the conflict. So, so we need champions, and that's why precisely I think this discussion today has been very useful to to say that we need regional champions now um, to 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 take it to not just be um, be the so the passive players and in, in invitees to meetings. They actually have to take it upon themselves to just say, well, let, let's actually do something, uh, do something about this. The Taliban must not be allowed to uh, to be able to call, decide terms. Um, so as I was saying that the, this conference must not have been allowed um, because right now the, you know, the, the one of the important sources of this war scenario is, is the, is a very strong uh, belief that the Taliban have actually communicated. It's not like they are hiding it in their back in the back of their minds. They're actually talking about the fact that it's um, that the, that what the process over the last two years, uh, from their point of view, was really a negotiation of of a U.S. withdrawal, and now that has been achieved. As far as Afghans are concerned, they haven't. They, they you know they have they've never really committed very um, very. Uh, clearly to uh, to to an intra afghan uh, peace agenda so and that has to be created with help of the region now so I'll, I'll stop at that very good thank you Apresia? yes uh, thank you Rana. i have the opportunity to express my solidarity with indian uh, brothers who are facing uh, this pandemic uh, we uh, we are with them of time in these tough times. Uh, I, I, I would just like to say that uh, for having sort of regional activity, we must uh, focus on reviving these track two meetings. And since uh, we, it, because of the pandemic, it, it can't be done physically, so we can start it virtually by virtual meetings. Uh, and I think you, you had great experience, Radha, uh, when you used to have those uh, Trilateral meetings, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, but they were not just trilateral. You remember, you would always invite Iran, Russia, Chinese, Central Asians. So that sort of uh, is very good. Uh, for starting this track one, we need to activate uh, uh, track two. Uh, and I think uh, if situation allows uh, our Indian friends, our dairy policy group, for uh, for example, had very great experience. Our friend from Art of Asia Society in Kabul, uh, they a great job, and I think they uh, are capable of uh, organizing some of these activities. And we can also pitch in from Pakistan and our diasporas uh, in, in the Western countries. So I, I, I think that, that that is something that we should uh, immediately uh, focus on. Thank you. Thank you. I was actually going to suggest to Jave that uh, that uh, perhaps the Heart of Asia uh, Society and the Kakar Foundation might think of doing some regional dialogues. And we can certainly, I can pass on to you all the notes and so on from the previous ones, as well as Absolutely. the context. Well, well, thank you so much for that suggestion. It's uh, it's very much uh, what we um, are thinking ourselves. Some we already do, but I think uh, specifically uh, on on the point by uh, by Khatak side, I, I think it's um, no. We we would be obviously uh, delighted. So you know, maybe maybe offline we can follow this up. But it's very much consistent yeah. with one of the things that we are doing on the track two dialogue front already. Great. Last words to Javan. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Radha. I think uh, uh, I, I would like to say that uh, uh, we have to give a chance to peace to Afghanistan. So we have to uh, give it a chance. And I think uh, I, I agree very much with Ambassador Ludin that uh, there is a possibility that a civil war can happen in Afghanistan, but that doesn't mean that people in Afghanistan want a civil war. So this is something that uh, Cocker Foundation and Heart of Asia Society have been uh, kind of uh, trying to 
promoted that as, as some form of a civil conversation in Afghanistan. And we had recently an event at Kabul University that why it's important for us that we should actually think positive and, and, and move forward and, and not think of a civil war. So that is uh, something uh, that should just keep remembered. And I think uh, then uh, obviously everyone talked about the, the role of the region. So yes, it's important, but I think uh, uh, Afghans uh, and, and Pakistanis and, and Indians and everyone else in the region should have very open, transparent and public conversation. I think it's important to be uh, connected to the wider global world. And we are going to be connected whether we want it or not Afghans, but I think the future of Afghanistan, as it is actually very well set in the forward note to the volume that uh, the region itself, like Iran, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, these countries matter more to Afghanistan than, than the United States. Yes, the United States is a major global power and, uh, and, 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 and we can't escape that. Uh, but uh, the truth is also that we live, we live in, a, in, a, in a very different part of the world and, and, and that's something that Afghans have to realize and find their ways uh, so around that uh, and, and work their way. So uh, that's, uh, I will end my remarks there. I will definitely encourage everyone to read the volume. I think it's uh, an exciting volume. Uh, there are different aces from different people and uh, I'm sure they are not going to regret from just uh, reading a fresh perspective on, on, on what has happened in the past and what's happening now in the present or maybe not in the future. So I invite everyone to just uh, have a look and, and read it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jawan. Uh, it remains for me to uh, thank our moderator, Lakta Brahimi, uh, for so skillfully managing to keep us within time and uh, the India International Center, in particular Tete of the Program Committee uh, for organizing this book discussion, and Wasim for ensuring that after the first hiccups, the technology has been seamless. And of course, thank you to all of you who were kind enough to log into this discussion and to give us so many interesting questions to answer I was really impressed to see we have people from, uh, obviously some from Afghanistan, but also from um, Turkey, from the US and from England uh, and from Pakistan listening in. So thank you again, India International Center. And goodbye. 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 Thank you all for participating.